Hi, I'm Becca Otis from Five Lines Pottery in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Ryan Durbin from RD Ceramics located in Southgate, Kentucky. And welcome to Wheel Talk. Hey guys, we've loved answering all of your questions so far. If you'd like to hear your question on the podcast, please send them to us on Instagram at Wheel Talk Podcast or by email to wheeltalkpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Bam. Bam. We're live. We're live. Hi, Becca. Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm not, I'm... Are they all sweaty? I can't tell. I don't think they are. <laughs> I was raising my arms to stretch, and armpits it looked like sweaty. my armpits and my <laughs> shirt was sweating, but I don't think they were, so. All right, we're good. Somebody sponsors with dry fit shirts for, for Ryan here. No, I'm kidding. He wouldn't. They wear cannot them. be 100% uh, cotton. Yeah, <laughs> they Becca has told 100%. me that that I'm too picky with my shirts. It's got to be a. You are. It's got to be a double blend of something or tri blend. I'm also picky with my shirts. They have to be free. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's not picky at all. <laughs> um, how was how was this week? This you were gone. Tell us how you're... I was gone, uh, yes. Uh, we did not chat last week because I was out of town in Raleigh, North Carolina for a work conference, which was great. Yeah. Um, typically, at that conference, my... So, my... Uh, I work for Citrix, which is actually one of the headquarters or offices is in Raleigh. So, there are a couple people that work out right. of that office and then uh, met up with the rest of the team. So, there was about six or seven of us that got together. Nice. That live in different places from like Charleston and Atlanta and then a couple more in Raleigh and three more in Raleigh. So, uh, so yeah, that was good. And normally we like present at it, but this year we did not. So it was a little more chill and we've been... I didn't know normally you present at it. I presented at it last yeah. year or not last year, 2019 I did. Oh. It's, they have like smaller sessions. So they have like keynote stage ones where... They talk like for yeah. forty five minutes to the entire audience, and then they have like breakout sessions that are, you know, more focused for thirty forty five minutes. Yeah. So yeah, I presented with a coworker back in twenty nineteen. So uh, the yeah, it's the it was Pendemonium Conference, which is Pendo is the product that we use at Citrix to help us with. It's like it like sits on top of our application that helps people like understand understand like new features that are in the product or help walk them through like onboarding th things when they first become a customer. So we call it like in product messaging is kind of the team. It's like a little safety hat. <laughs> a little safety hat. <laughs> yeah, so it it's a way to just help people get more out of value out of what they paid for. Um yeah. So yeah, we've we've been using that product for a while. So we don't really get as much out of the conference content. So it's more like networking for us and getting to see the team. Because I hadn't seen... The last time I actually went out of town for work was a year ago, back in October. Almost a year yeah. ago for that same conference. So yeah. nice to see people in person and then... And not in masks. And... Yeah, no masks and... You know, it was cool because I don't know if you saw the photos, but it was it was very like indoor, outdoor. They yeah, had, like, it looked really food nice. trucks out front. It was at the Performing Arts Center, so the like keynote was in this like, perform. Uh, I don't know if it's like a concert hall. It was basically like a theater, the mm -hmm. performance theater, and they had breakouts in different rooms. Other than that, um, but yeah, it was pretty sweet. And then I took some little pots with me, and that was fun. I took five of the little like carved tester cups and I hid them in Raleigh while I was there. So I hid like, I think two of them around town out and mm -hmm. about that other people could get. And then I hid three like inside the conference while I was there and I was like tagging yeah. them on it and they were like resharing it. And I chatted with the, you know, the social media manager and then somebody like uh, two of them got were picked up by staff from like pendo so they were kind of yeah. they weren't like attendees but <laughs> but that's still cool yeah you know? yeah so uh 
one girl I talked to, she found it, and she's actually a small business owner as well. I think she makes jewelry, like Indian-inspired oh, nice. jewelry. And, um, yeah, real, like, colorful stuff. Uh, and she, like, found me after she found the cup and was like, thank you so much. And we chatted for, you know, a few minutes and uh, crossed paths oh. a couple more times. And and then uh, another person found one, and then hopefully somebody else found the other one. So, so yeah, yeah. that was a fun little experiment while i was there i will do those but i'm like really fucking like (laughs) i'll like i hid cups in monroe before i left and i found one a year later because i hid it so well it was under the bench in the weeds (laughs) oh my gosh the weeds grew so much that they were never trimmed or cut so funny yeah, no. Did you put anything with it? It was hidden. You probably didn't really put a well. business card or anything in there. You just... I think I did. Oh, you did. Okay. I think I did, but I don't think it was visible at that moment. Yeah. Um. I I kind of started seeing Sailing Adrift Studios. Do you remember them? They would actually mm, go I around so. and put like these extravagant bowls that were like carved. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she would say like free art, and they would have all this all this stuff, and she would actually like go on art drops a few times a year and actually drop them in different places around the country. I'm probably going to do that. Yeah, you should I do that. In different places. That'd be sweet. Shitty, shitty drops. That's what we're going to call them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that was last week. It was kind of nice getting away from the studio, but, um, yeah, it's mostly like fun to just be around coworkers. Yeah. And, uh, they had the parties and stuff. I will not turn down free drinks for nothing. <laughs> Freaking pounding those drinks. Got the ciders and the rum and cokes and the Mai Tai. Did you get drunk? I, like, I got drunk. I threw up the last night before going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those where I was... Uh, well, first I got back to the hotel and I had to like drunk pack because I was leaving the next morning. Oh, no. So I was like, I'm not waking up and having to pack because I, I had to get up at like when six. When you're hungover. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like drunk packing everything. And then, you know, I lay down to go to sleep and the room's just spinning with my eyes shut. And I'm like, oh, this is not going to be good. I have a de- I think throwing up is my defense mechanism. Like, um, I don't drink very often. I know everybody probably thinks I'm a fucking alcoholic, but I'm not. Um, but when I do, I try to make it count. And so, um, but if I drink like a lot, my defense mechanism is to throw up. I'm like, okay, like I'll sit down and I'll be like, Becca, if you don't throw up right now, you're going to be miserable in the morning. So I like make myself throw up (laughs) almost like I think myself into throwing up. (laughs) Yeah, I was, uh, and then when we, when I, when I got up, my coworker also went to the airport with me because we both left about Mm eight 30 ish. She said she was feeling terrible. She, she, I was feeling a little bit when we were driving because you're like riding passenger, and if it, if it was rocky at all, like, I, don't, yeah. I mean, you get that way when you're riding passenger too. I was like, am yeah. I gonna get sick in this person's car on the way to the airport? Oh my god! Luckily, we didn't. And she, Nightmare. she said she was about to, but she didn't. Um, but yeah, got to the airport, got some Gatorade, and I was, good. I was good the next morning. I was just like tired and stuff. Yeah. But. For sure. Yeah. So that was last week. And then I got something new. Oh, yesterday. yeah. You didn't update me. So obviously. I didn't you, post you it on social either. I was going to do that and then I forgot. Yeah. Or I just didn't want to spend the time doing it. So I did get a new vehicle. Woo! RD Ceramics <laughs> is growing. <laughs> Yay! Um, yeah. So we got a third vehicle. We didn't, like, trade one in or anything like that. So I went... On Saturday, I did the whole used car shopping thing. The place I ended up getting it from was the the long drive. It was, like, an hour and ten minutes away. It's up in okay. Zinni, Ohio. Um, so, yeah, I did that. I was out for, like, six hours on Saturday, like, going to see three vehicles or five hours or whatever it was. It took yeah. forever. It actually wasn't too bad like Mm -hmm. getting into it and doing all the research and i'm like okay like there's only so much to do and then 
Like, the first one was the chillest because... And that's who I ended up buying from. He was like, you know, what are you looking for? He pulled it, you know, I called him the day before to let him know I was coming and what I was interested in. So they, like, you know, knew what to expect or whatever. And then he was like, all right, here it is. Have a look. You know, give me your license so you could test drive it, all that stuff. And then he was just like, okay, would you, you know, I come back, take my time. And then I come back in. And he's like, all right, what'd you think? All that. It was just he very, was super like, chill about chill it. Chill and relaxed. Yeah. And he was. He was probably in his, like, late 20s. Oh, that makes sense. So, you know, and and it was just him and his dad that did the, the selling there. So nice. it was pretty chill. And, you know, he was just giving me all the information. And I was asking about extended warranty. So he gave me all the information for that with the prices. And then I was like, you know, I got appointments to see a couple more today. So, you know, and obviously I drove by myself. So I'm not taking a car with me. And uh, pretty much left it that. And then I went to the next one. It was like a car dealership, like a Chrysler Dodge dealership. And, you know, I was like looking at the vehicle. I actually like made the trip kind of out of my way to stop while I was in town because um, yeah. I wasn't going to because I already had another thing scheduled, but uh, stopped in. And then I was, I was just going to drop in, like see it, get the figures. Like I wanted the car price see if i can get any better on the price and then get the warranty information so i could see and compare prices yeah of what i'm actually going to end up paying and they were like all right are you financing whatever can we talk to the the call the bank and start that and i was like i'm just here looking i stopped here because i'm in town and i don't want to decide today so i got to get to another appointment i'm already late so they're the fucking worst, man. And then, I, I don't know what it is. I think, and then when you ask a question, they go back in the room and they talk to somebody for, like, five minutes. I'm like, are they doing this on purpose? Like, do they already know the answer and they're just, like, oh yeah, trying it's the worst. to fuck me over? Not fuck me over, but, like, are they trying to just, like, have me waiting there even longer? Right. Like, I also, I also had a similar experience when I was, like, looking for the van and I found a used van, and it was in horrible shape, and they want so much money for it. And and it was like, they're like, what can we do to make you buy this vehicle? Like, what Like, what can we do? Like, And they, I was like, I'm going to need this much money for my car and an extended warranty with the, the vehicle, blah, blah, blah. And, like, I basically was like i'm gonna have to go home think about it and he was like what can i make you do to to buy it right now and i was like nothing <laughs> i am going home be like does your he, dinner rely on me buying something today because and he like called me like three times afterwards oh my gosh and i ended up like getting my credit score financed and i wish that i would have like he checked your credit is that what you mean yeah yeah, which is fine. Is is it a soft pull, pull or a hard pull when they do the car stuff? I don't know. I don't know either. It doesn't matter. But I don't think they um, took my social at any of the places except for the one I ended up buying at. So yeah, but I'm glad that you had like a laid back person. It's like, dude, if you don't fucking like, and they sell me, and they didn't call me or I'm anything. Buy it from like you. the guy that I ended up getting for. I mean, I looked Saturday. They're closed Sunday, and I yeah. called him Monday. So like. Right. You know, it was pretty chill and we chatted. So, and I told him that I was like, you know, I appreciate, I ended up going with you all because it had the best, it was really between that and the car sales person because the other, mm -hmm. the third one I looked at was like bare bones work vehicle and it had right. the most miles on it. So I was like, I'm not going with this one. Um, so, and I was just like, Hey, I appreciated your you know, not pressuring me and, you know, just give me the facts and give me the details and then kind of let me weigh my options. Yeah. And it was pretty easy to make a decision. So I'll let him know that. Yeah. I like people like that at car dealerships. That's how I would be too. But also I do find, I don't know if this happened to you, but like I walked into multiple dealerships and just stood there. Oh, really? And was like, um, but did you call ahead or anything? Did they know you were coming? No, no, but no, I didn't even know I was coming. Oh, okay. But I just like stood there like, and nobody even fucking talked to me. Really? And, like I realize that I'm looked, I look homeless. I understand that, but like, 
<laughs> Maybe they think you're waiting on somebody. <laughs> no, I was standing there like obviously looking at them like, "Hello, will you please?" I mean, I just is, me? I just figured I needed to call ahead because I wanted to be in and out of there with as little like I want them to expect me so they get the car pulled around, they get the car fax pulled up, they get all the details that yeah. I want so that I can ask questions and get the answers quickly. Yeah. Um I don't know. I feel like most people you don't have to call ahead and tell them what vehicle you're interested in and whatnot. No, no. But it is nice when you don't call ahead to see how prepared they are as a person. Like the first place that I went that was like super salesy, mm-hmm. I was like, I asked and he knew nothing. Their salesiness was trying to over override their like expertise yeah, in this nothing. specific and vehicle. And I was like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> gross. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so we got that oh. back. It was nice. I've been... Uh, you already know this. But Will you tell everybody what you fucking got? I've been... Okay, I got a 2014 Ford Transit Connect Titanium. Ew. The VIN number is... Blah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's nice. It's got the... Uh, it's got like... I don't think it's leather. It's kind of leather. Maybe like a fake leather or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like nice seats. It's got the heated seats. It's got the like climate control in the front where like passenger and driver can have different climates. Nice. Um, a little less than a hundred thousand miles. Uh, it's got the like tech stuff, backup camera, and then it's not like just a work van on the inside. So it does have the three rows of seats, and then they can go all the way down, and like mm-hmm. flat, so you can put cargo and whatnot in there. So that's dope. So, yeah, I think it'll be a good uh, road trip car, but also... I'm stoked. I'm going to take it this weekend to my, my show, and we'll see how it goes, but I'm excited. It's it's exciting to, like, put everything in, in a new car and be like, okay, this is going to fit better than this, and this is, you know, like, yeah, switching I'm, it around and figuring out. I think I'm basically just going to make sure that the surface area of the floor is covered so that the things don't shift and move, like... That seems like the best idea to make sure everything is tight left and right and front to back. Yeah. Instead of stacking and then leaving gaps and then things like fall over. But yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think I'm going to put any like big like storage contraptions in there to like hold everything or, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've talked in the past, but basically I've been saving for years so that I could buy a vehicle in cash. So I paid cash for it. Like, which is so exciting. I didn't want to deal with interest rates and all that stuff, and I had the yeah. money for it. So, I mean, that's that's why I saved my money for the business for years. Yeah. So exciting. So yeah, that that was the big happening. What about you? I know we're already quite a bit in here, but eighteen minutes. You know in. what? Fuck it. We've been doing this like I don't know. We haven't talked for a week, so. Yeah, you guys are just gonna have to fucking deal. <laughs> um. Uh, what was I going to say? So, this week has been kind of like, I had a show, last week I had a good week, sales-wise. So, I did the the update with the earrings and made like $700, um, which isn't like a ton, but like... What was the price you know, points? I don't remember the price point. I never saw what the... 28 to to 40 Okay. So, I feel like my goals are kind of like shifting, you know? And it's like, if you don't need a ton of money, you don't like... like a 700 bucks in an update i'm like sweet but i feel like you went <laughs> you know? pretty you took it more seriously than you have in the past with updates because you were posting a lot i definitely did because i needed that money <laughs> um and then i did really good at the farmer's market on thursday like really good mm. i made like 400 500 at the farmer's market wow like this is a market that i normally make like 100 to 150 and i sold five mixing bowls the mixing bowls um, those mixing bowls are fucking hot tickets, man. I can't make them fast enough. That's good. I've already made three. Uh, no, I made like two and a half sets more, and I think they're already sold. Are you making um, them in sets, or you're selling them one off? Well, I sell them. They're set up as sets, and you could buy them one off, though. Okay. You know. So um, made a bunch of money on on the Thursday, and then I had a show on Saturday, and I made a okay amount of money it wasn't like crazy good but it was like probably like 400 f- something i don't know but this week end turned out to be like 
you know, it turned out to be um, like 1600 bucks, which was good for me. Um, for a week? Is that what she's, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Between the update and your shows? Yeah, let's look. So, um, yeah, so last week between the 11th and the 17th was 1634, just on Square. So that was nice. Um, the show that I went to was really, like, small. T- I didn't expect a lot from it. So Was it in I Indianapolis? It was outside of Indy in a smaller town. So Okay. And it was, like, set up by, you know like these old school rockers you could tell that just like art and music and like oh. uh, and there was like a folk band with a um, bagpipe guy that was really fucking annoying and <laughs> um uh but it, and like the lions club set up and sold walking tacos like oh, you know it was just like tacos. a down home it was like a down home country so good. type show <laughs> um uh but yeah no it was fine and i met some new people which was good and, um, uh, yeah, and then I've just been kind of, like, making stuff. I'm kind of on a, just because of the kilns are being used by, like, Sarah and Merritt right now, because they have shows, so I'm just making yeah. every day. And I have a show this weekend. Nothing's going to get made for it, which is fine. Um, what I have is enough. And then, um, yeah, but today I was, like, so not motivated at all. And then I was talking to my buddy. And then, have you ever seen the movie Down Periscope? I don't think so. Well, it's it's on HBO Max right now. And I completely and 100% recommend watching it because it's fucking hilarious. It is, is so Is it actually funny. a comedy? It's, yeah. Oh, okay. It's Kelsey Grammer's the main character. Um, okay. I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Yeah. It's, it's an actual comedy. It's And it's like just really funny um and so i was talking to my friend and we were talking about that movie and so then i ended up watching that movie while i was throwing and i made some small uh espresso shot cups nice espresso cups so that's pretty much what's going on not not too much craziness but yeah i've been glazing like crazy over here erica's been helping out and then i before tonight's over i think i'm gonna start my next kiln so it'll be the fourth firing of the week Nice. Start on. I think I've pretty much been doing a firing every day, because I had the two kilns, so I've been like cycling through. Switching them, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I I'm just kind of overdoing it, because I, I mean, I do have more space in the vehicle, so I can fit more. But yeah, you know, Rachel just well, got done sanding yeah, a bunch what of I, stuff. But what I figure is. So I can't really use the kilns, and the Merritt was like, well, you could put a biscuit in, and I was like, what's the point? Like, if Merritt can do it fast, like, if she can get her process going faster, um, then I'm fine with that. And, like, if I just get a bunch of greenware that's ready to go, and once Sarah, like once Merritt's done next Thursday, I can just fire off, like, three bisque kilns in a row, then by the time I get back, because I'm going to Colorado on the 1st, by the time I get back, I can... Um, just glaze the shit out of everything yeah you know it seems like you all almost have to schedule out your kiln sharing response they they do so what happens is that they schedule it out since theirs are more important and then i just kind of like move around them essentially because i always have stuff why are theirs more important um because they are procrastinators and they um oh so they need they need it like in this short period of time I'm not going to no, they're not procrastinators. They, but they do have a lot of like carving and stuff and they do tend to like wait and like fire right before they have an important show. Oh, okay. You know, like this is the Michiana pottery tour. Right. Sarah's going to be there. That's a big one. Yeah. And so she's like firing right now so that she can get done by the time that she goes up there, which makes total sense. I do that too, but I also just fire all the time. Like I can always have something. Right. Like that. So, so it's not it, like important for me. Yeah. Do they fire to, at least the same schedules? So like they could, they, have a, they could co-load a kiln. They can. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know they both but, have like intricate carved things, so they probably don't create the quantity yeah. that you do, but yeah. you know, they still need to fill. The only problem is kiln. that I fired a cone five and they kind of fired a cone six. So like they can't put their stuff in my kilns, 
which is a bummer because like uh, sometimes I could like okay. throw theirs in, you know. But I throw the bisque in it when I can. Their bisque stuff in when I can. So yeah. Um, but yeah, it's worked really well. Like our system has worked really well and they like have a calendar and they put their thingies on the calendar. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I know where to kind of take a break. Fit it and, in, yeah. Yeah. So nice. So I'll just go balls to the walls when I get back on the 10th because there's like a huge show the 15th, the, this must be it. And then after that's the coffee show. So yeah. Coffee, coffee. Coffee and tea show. Um, Coffee and tea show. Yeah, I had a show this past weekend. They had a great band. A couple bands that were playing. It was great. And uh, I saw good. It was like really windy and stuff in that area. Because it's just a a large flat field. And then there's like a a mansion or something. And there's a like courtyard area at the park uh, where we have it. So it was the weather was perfect. I sold like 1100 maybe. I sold there nice. last year too. It was pretty good. So it was kind of a little like in between show between the big one that's this weekend. It's in Madison, Indiana. So that one, I've heard that one's a good show. And yeah. we'll see. I'll be super prepared for that one, I think. And then hopefully we will be hustle bustling and be packing lots of pots and then. Uh, I'll be figuring out what I need to restock on when we get back, so. Yeah. I'm, like, curious how my finances are going to go when I go out to Washington or to Colorado. I'm, I should probably, I don't know. Is that trip going to cover what you would need to make income-wise for two weeks or ten days? No, but I, I, like, if I had gone out just for the weekend, you know, just to, just work with who I'm going to work with, then it would be fine. But I've decided to kind of like take a break and like take a little vacation. So, Mm -hmm. so um, you have a couple other consults while you're there besides the one, uh, potentially I do have, I'm going to meet out with a high school, Greeley high school. Um, one of the teachers out there wants me to come out and they're going to pay me, which is cool. Oh, wow. To talk to their, their high school class. Mm Mm-hmm. Nice. Don't sugarcoat yeah. it. That'll be great. Yeah, and then um, we'll see if... And I was supposed to do a... I don't know. Are you going to see Liz while you're out there? I hope so. I'll, I'm going to text her. Also, I'm going to see, like... You know, we're going to have a dinner with some of the people out there, so... so Sweet. Yeah, that'll be good. And... Um, yeah, it'll be good. I... Pff- I'll take some earrings or something. I'll make earrings while I'm out there. You know, I'll like. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you're not driving, right? Clay. You're flying, so. Yeah, I'm flying. Yeah. But I can like take a container of clay. Like I can take like a pound of clay, and it'll probably last me like a whole fucking week. That's true. Yeah. Make earrings put something. them in a Tupperware container on your way back or whatever. Or I could just not take anything and not work on anything. So that that too. Yeah, you could do yeah. that too. So we'll see, but parents' hot tubs. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> hot tub, the swim tub, the swim tub. I only go in the swim spot because the hot tub. I like to move around. <clears throat> it's probably pretty nice this time of year in Colorado, right? It, it was ninety degrees yesterday, I think. There, so. Well, you're going here in two weeks, right? So. Yeah. Maybe it'll get better in two weeks. Yeah, I don't know. Um. But yeah, so excited about that. Let's see, Berthed. It's 50 degrees in Berthed right now. I guess. And it's just yeah, after they're gonna be dark in the 80s, there, so. 70s to 80s right now, uh, the next couple of days. Okay. So, yeah. That'll be good. I haven't flown in a long fucking time, so. Yeah, the flight to Raleigh was the, I, I don't. We flew to St. George, Utah, and that was the last time. January. You drove. You didn't drive last year, did you? I drove. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. I drove. And you're driving again this time. I'll drive this year. Hopefully, I have the van by then. Um, Jeez. I don't know when Hopefully it's Hopefully, you don't have they to don't... wait until this. You don't have to wait like you're kiln. 
I know. Waiting nine months for a freaking... <laughs> I think he said that the he was like I can't be definitive, but I would imagine no longer than three months, and that puts me like right right at, in December. Yeah. So if that's the case, if that's the case, I'll probably just ride my lease out and just double up on payments. Um, I was gonna end my lease early, but if that's the case, I might just ride my lease out. I mean, could you end on, it like three months early instead of six months early? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but I'll just throw a mattress in the back, you know, uh-huh. no insulation, just kind of just like. Oh, yeah, because you're going to have to build it out. Like, where are you going to have the tools right, and the like re- resources in, to do all that? January, January, I'll be driving around. So if that's the case, I won't build it out before that. I'll just throw a mattress in the back, drive out to the the West Coast and do it that way, you know? Yeah. Super simple. So, yeah, I've been looking at a lot of videos and I have a lot of ideas and I don't know if I told you this, but I'm going to put a fucking studio in the back of my van. A studio? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, so I'm getting the extended wheelbase. So it's a well, it's 159 inch wheelbase and then it's the extended version. So it's 14 inches longer. And the, the van is essentially what I could understand. It's like. You, if you split it up into three sections behind the driver's seat, it's like 14 and a half feet. Or not 14 and a half, four and a half, four and a half, four and a half. So three sections of four and a half feet. So I figure I can make a shorter living space and then put a four foot studio in the back that's four by six because it's six feet wide. Four by six. I'm trying to think of how big my desk is here that I'm sitting at. The desk is four, four by, it's probably three foot, maybe, four by two and a half. Okay. So it's not going to be, and it'll be four feet wide, and then, but wait, if you think about it, the, the doors open, right? And they make an extension of walls, and so I'm going to figure out how to have a platform that I can just pull out and then put down on the ground, like put you know, mm-hmm. joists down on the ground so I can have an extended platform so I could have a four, an eight by six. Yeah. I mean, really what you need is like wall of shelves, right? And then you need a exactly. tabletop area and like a seat. Yeah. It's not like, it's not going to be crazy. And then whatever you yeah. need to store, whatever stuff you need like, for this. There's going to be a slat wall on one side, which I can put slat wall shelves on. And then, and then, uh, a tabletop that I could put my portable wheel on and probably another lifted shelves that I could put my computer on. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And then it's going to be walled off though. Somehow. I don't know if it's going to be a removable wall or whatever to the cab because I don't want it to have, I don't want clay to kind of like move over. Oh yeah. Into that space. Cause you're going to have your like kitchen space or whatever right next to that probably. The bed. Or the bed the right worse. now. Worse. <laughs> the bed's going to be between... Yeah. Oh, okay. So the bed will be kind of like against a wall. And then exactly. the studio is going to be like enter from the back kind of deal. Yeah, but I'm going to put like a removable, like a slide partition. So it'll be able to be removed if it's like clean and stuff. But I don't want it to... I don't have any interest in... Yeah. And having clay in the rest of the other part. You're like, no, you think you. you don't have space? I got a four by six back of my vehicle to work out. <laughs> yeah. So. Wow. Lots of lots of new things. Lots of. Uh, yeah, lots to experiment with and like build out for sure. Is it basically yeah. an empty tail end? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know if it has floors. Hopefully it doesn't. God, I hope it doesn't. Um, like the plastic so. floor, but floor bottom. Yeah. It'll just be easier if it's bare. I can't remember. I, I looked at the specs and nothing popped out at me, so it should be it's fine. It's crazy how much it is just for like a bare bones. It's ridiculous. But it's, I mean, it is like heavy duty metal and stuff, I guess. So it's like. I guess. I, yeah. I mean, and it is like a 3,500, so it is a one ton. Well, you said extended wheelbase. Chassis. Does that mean that it's got two wheels, like on, like? 
No, it's got the regular four wheels, but then it's got... It's just wider? It's not wider? the extended wheelbase. It's just the extended... The wheelbase is normal. It's just the extended back, so it's 14 inches longer. 14 inches longer. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Nice. <sighs> Okay, we should probably talk about what we're supposed to talk about. Yeah, it's like we're thirty thirty five minutes in. Yeah. All right, we had a we had a review we wanted to read that was uh, fairly new. I have it. All right. Okay, it is from Mostly Mugs, um, and it says it's five star. It says keeping me back, keep me coming back for more. The posting schedule of this podcast conveniently aligns with the day I normally work on POTS, so it seems like I'm always listening to and looking forward to the latest episode of Wheel Talk. This podcast is a treasure trove of information for those like me who are trying to make a hobby or business working with clay. It is light and fun and easy to listen to. I also appreciate that they take time to answer listener questions and or respond to, respond to social media on social media thanks ryan and becca for making my garage studio a little less boring mostly mugs nice thank you thank you i think she just wrote me on instagram a couple days ago actually so it's kind yeah. of yeah i also want to say that if you leave a review i do believe it takes like a week or two weeks to get posted because i think she wrote this like way before it actually got posted yeah i mean it it said it was posted like early september so a few weeks ago. Yeah. Well, I, I just remember when she told me that she did the review. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, we were talking for some reason. and We were talking about something and she wrote one, so. Nice. Yeah, thanks for leaving that. We always like reading those. All right, so we got a few... Also, if you're going to leave a one-star review, could you please um, tell us why? Like, could you actually leave a fucking review? Why? We need something to laugh at. <laughs> Kidding. Not really. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is our first question? Yeah, we're so gonna do just some questions. We have so we have three listener questions that are fairly studio related, so be a little more uh, hands on technique kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. So the first question is from anonymous. Have you tried attaching handles with vinegar or that magic water shit? I often develop a little hairline crack or it separates when where I attach the handle to the bottom of the mug no matter how careful I score slip and let dry slowly. Have you ever used that? Uh, I have. Yes. Yeah. Did it help? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. We had it in high school when I first started. It was in the like squirt bottles and you could tell cuz it always said like vinegar and water or something vinegar. and it stunk like crazy. So I have some in this square bottle. I use it for um So fun fact, I I found out that um I was talking to Link who owns Kentucky Mudworks and uh I've been hand building with their Dark Star. Not a great clay to hand build with. <laughs> and I was talking on the phone with her and she's like, "Yeah, so I'm a thrower, and uh, it's great to throw with. <laughs> and then I make the clay, and everybody's like, "This kind of sucks for hand building." <laughs> and yeah. you're like, and she's like, "Okay." <laughs> what makes it um, bad to hand build with? It's a little short, and the reason it's a little short is because it um, has less bentonite in it for faster throwing. Um, so it's great, like I said, great throwing clay. Um, so it crackles. So I've been using a lot of vinegar to kind of like help with it not crackling and i actually i was talking to her and she's like yeah i would just use speckled b mix <laughs> and i was like cool <laughs> so, i mean like a bag of clay is gonna last me like 15 years so it'll be fine but um i still throw with dark star but um yeah as far as the vinegar goes i don't know if it even helps but you can try um it's i mean it doesn't hurt by any means. What I wouldn't do is put the vinegar behind a badge of any sort um, because it tends to expand a little bit and then like the, it needs to like air out a little bit and it sometimes like pokes holes into the badges. Um, have you done? Hmm. Have you done? I don't I, I don't think? use it. I just used it in high school when we were doing the slip and scorn for handles and whatnot. From what I would I mean the brief 
re the brief thing I just looked at. It was just saying it helps like break down the particles, like okay. the clay particles. So, I mean, I think as long as you're scoring it enough, and then I usually just use actual slip. So maybe if you're not using slip, a vinegar and water might help break it down into a more slip consistency on both sides when you're yeah. joining it. To yeah. kind of mesh okay. it, but I Here's... use slip as my like stick sticking them together kind of thing here's my here's my uh suggestion for you anonymous uh, since we don't know what your mugs look like what i've had this issue a lot actually because my clay back in washington was absolute shit and um <laughs> and i um i would say the, what worked for me was to kind of work with it less, if that makes sense. Like, when I put on the handle, if you can get away with it, like, I always just punched on the bottom of the handle, and I didn't, like, smooth it onto the mug. I just left it there so you could see the little, like, where it joined. Um, also... <laughs> I know this is like a really shitty like this is kind of shitty advice but like if you can put the bottom of your handle high enough so that your glaze covers it just fucking cover up that crack like that's like yeah. super shitty advice but it is al almost like a lot of clays just crack no matter what and and like if you can cover it up with a glaze and you can't even tell then it's no some of my shit. top attachments will subtly have a little yeah, not it's crack, not a, but it, it like a, it just like it it doesn't have a nice smooth um, yeah. join. I wouldn't call it a yeah. crack. It's just like separated a little bit, but the glaze does fill yeah. that in right there at the top. Right, like the the thing that I just found, I think, was the harder I tried, the more cracks I got. So I started trying a little bit less, and I think the vinegar can definitely help. Um, like are you drying your mugs upside right or upside down maybe dry them a different way um uh, uh like are you using porcelain are you using you know what kind of do you have a lot uh, of airflow in your studio do you like yeah. what do you do after it's joined um you could put some toilet paper into the slip um it'll just dissolve paper clay. that might help so it's a little bit more like joiny. That might help. Um, uh, t -t 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 uh, funny story. Uh, when I do my earrings, I have to join them. You know, um, they're wet, but I just lick them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'll I'll roll out the coil and I cut it and I just lick it and then stick it together. <laughs> because fun fact, if you didn't know this, magic water is your spit. <laughs> essentially it's like the same components so um um using spit is basically the same as magic water um so if it if you feel like it's not attaching just kind of like hock a loogie right on top of your i used to do that with my handles back in the day when i would attach yeah. handles i would literally spit on every single one yeah instead of and I'm then i started using slip just because i got tired of like doing the that's free magic water readily available yeah um, so yeah, uh, also maybe I used a stamp at the bottom of my mugs, uh, bottom of the handle just to like push in the handle a little bit. So it's really joined. That might help. Um, I think you just I have to be like... a little firm on your attachment. Like, and you know, if you're worried about being too firm at the bottom attachment, maybe it's because your mug body is too soft when you're attaching the handle. Mm -hmm. Like. I usually take the clay that I use for the handle is right out of the bag, essentially. Um, you could always... What I've been doing lately is kind of batch making them so that I will slip and score all of the mug body. I'll do like five mug bodies, slip and score, and then I'll roll out five carats of clay, roll those out, yeah. slip and score, and then I'll go through and, you know, uh, put the slip on them, attach them, and then go through wonder, and pull them. Like, I, yeah. The subtlest amount also, of letting them dry might firm them up a little bit more. 
Right. I wonder also, is it maybe too dry, too, when you're attaching? Like, it could be from being too dry as well. Like, maybe you need to attach your handle before you trim um, and then trim afterwards. Oh, uh, yeah. That's a little tricky, but it's very doable. I used to trim after attaching handles all the time. Um, I think it can also I, be harder to join if if your mug body is trimmed and it's burnished a little bit. Like, let's say you yeah. use a, a, a yellow rib or something to burnish the bottom, and you're trying to attach a mug handle to that. It kind of mm-hmm. slides. Like It's not going to grip as much. It's kind of like a... yeah. It's like the pores are like closed because it's They're been tighter, burnished yeah. versus being more open to moisture, you know? Yeah. It's hard to like not have a definitive answer, you know, but it's like there could be so many things that you could do to change it. And sometimes it's just the fucking clay. <laughs> like when I was working with all those mugs in Washington, I literally couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just the clay. I had to count on the glaze to cover it up. Like, I had done everything. Toilet paper, vinegar. I don't know. All the things. Prayer. Threatening. Everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I typically will, at a minimum, after I attach them, obviously I'll leave them out until the end of the attaching, and then I'll usually put them in plastic if they are finicky and the mug body's a little drier or... You know, yeah. I'm I, I'm running the risk and I'm getting a little... Cl- like, I will put it in a damp box at least overnight, maybe for a couple maybe days. The, yeah, because, like, covering them might not be enough. Maybe putting them into a damp box would help just to rehydrate everything consistently. Yeah. You know, that might be helpful. That would be the safest bet. Like, if I'm, if I'm worried about it, I will throw it in a damp box. And then you can take it out and dry it as fast as you want. Mm-hmm. Like, you, once it's hydrated all evenly you can just pull it out and yeah i mean i feel like once it's to a point where the mug body is dried enough and the handle's dried enough, like if it's starting to crack i feel like it's not something you're gonna like go back in and add moisture to fix yeah i've also heard of bisque fix too you could do it at the bisque stage hmm. um i think that does work what is that exactly i don't know i have no idea I've never used it, but I think I know people that have. Bisque Fix. Bisque Fix, yep. Yeah. I've heard of that, too. Yeah. Um, so that's an option. A little bit more spendy option, but it's an option. Okay. And then the, the Lindy actually sent one that was very similar to this that uh, she sent us. Uh, Lindy Gardner Ceramics. How do you rehydrate mugs that have gotten past the moisture level to attach handles? So, for me, simple answer if it's too dry, I will literally take the mug and dunk it upside down in the water mm-hmm. and let it rehydrate. And if it's not hydrated enough, I'll give it another dunk. Mm-hmm. Same with the bottom. If the bottom's not dry enough, you, you can almost see every single time I attach my handles, when I attach it at the top, when I, before I attach to the bottom and I start pulling the handle, I will actually put a little water down there at the bottom where it's going to join. Yeah. Just to add a little bit more moisture. And you can always dunk the bottom of the mug in too. Yeah. To rehydrate. That's what I do. I don't know. Do you do anything different? I haven't made mugs in a long time, but um, I typically do the same thing. Just dunk the whole mug. Yeah. I don't really like the spray. Me- like, I don't really want to have a board of pots and I just literally spray them. Like, oh, yeah. I don't think I've the- sprayed them, too. I don't I've know the evenness. Like, What I would recommend, though, is that if you do dunk your whole mug, don't put it back on its rim. Like, don't set it back on its rim because the rim is the most fragile part. Mm-hmm. So um, it's going to, like, disintegrate. <laughs> yeah. If it is really dry. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I'm usually so dunking I'm, when it's, like, like chocolate bar leather hard, where it's, like, a little stiff. Yeah. But even at that point, you it might also, be a little bit too past. If but. you have the time, you could also put them in a wet box. And that's a really good way to, to rehydrate. Mm-hmm. Like add a little bit more water to the plaster. That's what I did yesterday. I had some bowls for, made bowls for a friend, and um, she was carving them. So, uh, yeah, I just they were like dry at the rim, and I just threw them in the wet box. They were fine. Nice. Today, so, yeah. All right. That's what we do. Yep. 
keep it simple. All right, we got another one here from Tiny Cat Pottery. We've been putting this one off for a bit. Hey guys, I was wondering if you could touch on the best practices for studio waste and glaze disposal. Is it safe to dump water I use to clean tools after glazing in the backyard? Should I be taking it to a hazardous waste recycling plant? Does it depend what's in the glaze for how you go about disposing of it? Thanks. Love the podcast. Keep up the sass. Also, happy belated birthday, Ryan. It wow, is September was... 21st. That's that how long was... we put this off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, um, good job, us. Um, <laughs> so, the uh, we're not scientists, nor are we um, tree huggers. But I can't see anything wrong with putting glaze chemicals out in the yard. They're all from the earth anyway. I think mean, it depends on what kind of coppers. Like, some of the raw materials like that are mined, I would be a little bit more weary of. Like, heavy copper glazes or heavy... Maybe not the red iron ones. I feel like the iron is pretty... Iron's rock, right? Pretty common with, like, clay and stuff, too. Like, heavy iron clays. Um, I mean, obviously, if you live near like water is going to pass over it and run into a stream or something like maybe don't Don't do that don't do that um Um, but if you literally have like a pile of stuff i don't i mean i would i would be more likely to use it with would you i feel like i'd let it dry out all the way first instead of just dumping it but then i don't even know what i would like would it be better put it in a literal trash can versus dumping it in the yard if it was dried out here's my suggestion if you're really concerned about the environment (laughs) put put a hole in your backyard where you like don't care about it put a fucking five gallon bucket in that hole drill a shit ton of holes in the bottom or even hollow it out so that it or like and just dump all your leftover glaze stuff in there and then it's only contained in that area why would you put holes in the bucket then it's still i gonna, don't know it's still gonna seep down into the ground don't put holes in the bucket i don't fucking care um but i'm i mean i'm always gonna throw it out in the backyard i don't fucking care i mean the i mean the glaze stuff i make into mystery glaze so yeah i mean like that stuff i'll make into mystery glaze i would say do that i mean that's what they that's what they're saying they're saying they clean tools after glazing do they dump the water like i just keep one five gallon bucket of water in my glaze studio and i use that same bucket all the time no matter how like messy ish the clip the bucket gets like it's got glaze material in it so i will take off the clean water and then I'll make it into a mystery glaze with the sediment. But what happens? Once it's full enough. What happens when it's like? I don't know. What happens when it's like? There's too much of it. <laughs> you know, like. I feel what like happens most of these, have, these people like, are studio potters, though. How much are they literally producing? That's a good point. They're producing yeah. enough that a five-gallon bucket in their studio is taking up too much space. Would you, I mean, I'd rather, I mean, obviously I'd rather be dumping clay in my backyard than dumping glaze materials in my backyard. Yeah, I think you can, I think it's safe to say that you can dump clay in your backyard anytime. It's fine. Be fine with that. Yeah. Can we say that? I think that's fine. Okay. I've never dumped glaze in my backyard because I've always reused it. Um, or you literally put it up and say, hey, I have this, does somebody want it? Like. Yeah. Like, a, uh, but. I also wouldn't be totally opposed to dumping it in my backyard if I had to. Um, I I also want to pose another thing, another um, option. So if you got like a terracotta pot that was like big um, and put plug the hole up, you could dump the water out and just leave it in your yard, and the water will seep out, but it'll it'll um, filter out the chemicals. So. The water will come out, but the stuff on the inside won't. So that might be a good option, too, if you want, like, cleaner water. And what do you do with the terracotta pot? There's just a bunch of glaze material in there? Just throw it in the fucking trash. Like, when it's dry. 
Oh, so you're just drying out all the material. Like mm. if you were gonna, if you wanted to like dry it out and like save it or, or not save it, but like save the universe, then. Um, I mean, you could, you could probably. I mean, what would be the risk in making a, like having a crap bowl and putting big hunks of dry stuff in the bowl and firing it? It's gonna become glass, right? And then you just throw that, that away. That's a very bad idea. Just put the dry stuff in the trash. <laughs> Don't risk your kiln to try and save, you know. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, if you <laughs> if you went the long route of getting rid of it, like, you'd have to glaze every a bunch of pieces with this mm -hmm. crap glaze until the glaze was gone. I mean, a yeah. lot of places will have pickups once a year. Like, we have hazardous material drop-offs, like, once a year. You go to this place and you drop off hazardous. stuff. I hazardous. Like, I'm not sure it's hazardous waste. Like, I've heard a lot of people say that, like, the glaze pottery, like, the glaze water is fine for your garden, even. Like, because of the nutrients in the... I'm sure there's different metals that you probably don't want to be just dumping out. I mean, maybe, yeah. I... I think that it's fair to say that both you and me, if we were posed with a problem, would just dump it out in your yard. Um, yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I'm going to reuse it as much as possible because I do the mystery right. glaze thing. Obviously. But I would... Dumping in the yard would not be the very last thing I would do. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah. I would dump it in the yard before I would go the route of trying to glaze a hundred pieces with it just to get rid of it and then throw all those hundred pieces in the trash. Okay, it says or we don't know if somebody. this we don't know if this man is uh, valid or anything, but I'm gonna read the beginning of this thread. In my experience, trace of clay do not present a problem. Glazes, on the other hand, can be some of the chemicals which are in them can hurt them. I think they're talking about plants. Um, can hurt them, and some will just be absorbed into the plant. I know of someone who is living on a military base and had been growing vegetables on a vacant lot next to their housing. One day they noticed strangers taking soil samples of the vegetable garden. Several weeks later they received a letter saying that they should not eat, eat any of their vegetables they were growing and in the future should only plant flowers there. Plants absorb things just like people do. Oh, yeah. Don't pull, also, don't dump it in your literal garden. You know what? I also had a raku bowl that was glazed with this okay saturated copper matte glaze. I didn't like the way it turned out, and one day I decided to use it as a planter. It's porous, should work. Every plant I put in there got sickly and died. <laughs> um, yeah, that doesn't sound like you should be doing that. Don't put it in things you're going to eat or things that you expect to th yeah. thrive. I was thinking more like woods, but I mean, I literally live with woods behind me, but. Yeah, it does say pouring these chemicals on the soil creates a danger for pets. Can create. And wild pets. animals. Yeah. Yeah, obviously it depends on what kind of land you live on, too. Like, do you have a place to dump it? Right. Or is it literally going to be like 10 feet out your back door? Yeah, like, don't put it on your garden. Um, I hate to say it, but I would, like, offer it for free if it's, like, a big bucket of something that's, like, I didn't like this. Dude, here's a test tile. If you want it, come get it. Oh, yeah, I've done that. People, people buy them. Literally or free glaze. Them. Come get it. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the chemicals I wouldn't worry about, but, like... The copper and the, like, lithium. Mm hmm Titanium. I don't know. Maybe not titaniums. I mean, some of the stuff, like red iron oxide, isn't that, like, rust, right? I think so. Like, there's plenty of metals that literally rust and get rained on, and they run into the ground and... It does say that federal standards list, Tracy, federal standards lists ways to dispose of chemicals. Read the list of chemicals in your glaze. 
And you, uh, what do you do? So there must be a standard, a federal standard list for chemicals and the, the way you dispose of them. So that might be something to look up. Also, um, I will say this, if you are throwing it away um, at the dump or in a trash can or something like that, it has to be the consistency of peanut butter. So you can't like just throw water <laughs> into the dump. You have to let it absorb. Throw it in um, some cat litter or something. Yeah, so it has to be like a, a peanut buttery-ish type consistency so it doesn't just bleh, all over the stuff. Yeah, I threw away a lot of clay back in the day. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of inconclusive data on this thread. <laughs> Probably because nobody has done enough studies on dumping ceramic materials. Yeah. <laughs> Who's putting money into that? Uh, yes. I'm curious what, like, big factories do. Like East Fork Pottery or some of these big... Yeah, places. that is a good question. It would be a good question to ask them. Just to be like, hey, um, what do you do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let us know. Well, a lot of people are saying, please get the materials, the MDS, MSDS, uh, Material Safety Data Sheet of the glazes. Every glaze has one that's made, like, that you sell. Um, so yeah. you can ask for it from the company and they are liable to have one. They like, legally have to have one. Um, and then if you're making your own glaze, you basically have the material safety data, data sheet within your chemicals. But uh, that is a good way to figure out what's in them and what's like how to dispose of them or whatever. Yeah. I feel like we should just maybe just chalk this up with we don't know but this is what we do and we're terrible people for it so i've never thrown glaze out i haven't either i've always had to give it to somebody but i've always I also like have, it's always turned into a mystery glaze yeah i have like at least a five gallon bucket of glaze that i need to do something with though that got accidentally mixed up like two years ago that I literally have not decided what to do with it. But yeah, like when yeah. I mix my next mystery glaze up, I might put a little bit of that in there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And like, if you have a mystery glaze, that's a little bit dark, throw some black stain in there and then you got a black glaze. Like good, great, perfect. You know, throw a little stain in there to see if it will change. Um, but yeah, like if you're washing all of your tools out, make sure you're washing clay tools and clay water, glaze tools and glaze water. And then it just sinks to the bottom, take the top water off mm -hmm. and, um, and then mix it up when it's full. And then you have a nice sieve it out and then you have a nice yeah, throw mystery through glaze. Sieve. Gotta do that soon with my next refill some mystery glaze. All right. Do we want to do another one here? Do you want to read the next one? Yeah. This is like right up your alley throwing. This is right up my alley. Okay. It says, I have a throwing question. So I have a student who is having the hardest time pulling without pulling off lots of clay. What exactly is, is that caused by? Because she's got a good amount of water on her fingers, not too much or too little. She's moving slower than her wheel is turning, using the pads of her fingers rather than the tip. Um, and she's got her fingers staggered. Most of the students have taught, I've taught who've had this problem. It was always because of using their fingertips and it was fixed by using more of the pad of their fingers. But I'm wondering if that changed somehow else because of how much she's struggling with it. Do you have any ideas before I go in? <laughs> Well, she mentioned the speed. The speed was what I was going to go with, but she mentioned the water as well. Well, she didn't like really going... mention this. She did mention the speed, but I think she's stopping. She's like stopping, waiting, and then she's like, okay, I got to keep going. Yeah. I think it also has to do with like the amount that the clay is. Like, I think when I pull, I kind of like keep two fingers kind of next to each other when I'm pushing. I'm not pushing with just one finger and letting the clay literally like bulge out right above it. 
I kind of right, use. Is this your second pull or your first pull? Mo probably my second pull. Okay. I don't know. I feel like I just keep a couple fingers there, so it's more surface area than just one finger. Yep. And just kind of like p keeping the clay kind of inward so that I'm not like lifting like a, a tube or like lifting a coil up mm -hmm. I'm like kind of like lightly guiding it back up I don't know and I use a okay. sponge so so I'm gonna go through I don't exactly know what her problem is but I'm about to go through like a whole bunch of shit so if you want like a free lesson right now pause this <laughs> and get to is this your what, first fucking Is this pole. what you get into with the <laughs> consulting when you yeah. watch somebody do it? Yeah, so this is what... So pause... Yeah, pause it and get get to your first pull. Like, open up your base. <clears throat> okay, so... When you are doing your... There's two very different types of pulls. The first pull and the second pull, right? So our first pull is a compression pull. Our second pull is a height pull. Your first pull, I'm assuming, is what she's having issues with. I'm not sure. But what I can say is this. It's not necessarily about the tips or the pads of your fingers as it is about the speed, the consistency, and the pressure that you're using. So on your first pull, your fingers actually should be together. They are not going to be offset a little bit. They're going to be together because this is a compression pull. So you're moving all the molecules to the space that you need to be at. So um, when you're pulling up, what you want to do is you want to be less aggressive on the bottom. You want to still get like your clay off the bottom. You want to be less aggressive on the bottom. You actually want to be more aggressive on the top so that your top inch and a half is thin, almost as thin as what you want the pot to be when it's finished and the reason for that is because especially if you're using anything more than a pound you're going to be doing an aggressive second pull and that second pull if you're pulling up you're going to just take off the top of the the piece because you're too top heavy if you're even walls all the way up on your first pull that's great if you want to do four pulls but if you want to do two to three pulls then you want to have it thin at the top thicker at the bottom Okay, now I think with her, she's stopping. So the best way to teach how to do this is to, is to show the rotation of the wheel and then show your progression up the, up the side of the pot. And the easiest way to kind of relay it is say it's like a metronome. So every time you're going around, you're counting. And every time you're counting, you're continuing to move up. Um, if you really want to like watch her do a pull and you'll see if she stops and if she stops um say move your move your hands move your hands like get on her about like moving them up consistently instead of thinking about it and stopping uh then if she gets to her second pull that's where she wants to have um off-centered fingers and your your inside finger should be above your outside finger and the higher and the more depth you have between those fingers the more height you're going to get as you pull so same with the first pull you're going to be more aggressive on the bottom well actually it's it's opposite sorry i lied it's opposite than the first pull you want to be more aggressive on the bottom less aggressive on the top because our top is already to our thinness that we basically want it so you're going to you know get as much clay from the bottom as you as you can then once you get to about maybe an inch and a half maybe two inches then you're going to let up a little bit slow down a little bit and keep moving your hands up and then that should like center out your like you know uh, make the right height and um, thickness I really do think that it's her speed um, and it probably is that she's not being a, like as like her first pull like she's, she's reluctant yeah and also don't be afraid to stop in the middle of a pull like she could have not enough water for her you know um, if you are drying up like as you're pulling because you're going maybe a little bit slower stop get some more water and start right where you left <laughs> like there's nothing wrong with that i do it all the time 
Um, I don't know why teachers are telling that you that like that's like a bad thing. Like fuck them. Um, <laughs> if I like know that I don't have enough water, I usually will just kind of like let off, but like finish the pull. But I'm barely mm-hmm. putting any pressure, just to like go through the motion instead of just stopping. I stop. I get water and then I just start up again, um, like where I left off. But yeah, I think that it's probably the um, yeah, and and is her wheel moving too fast? Is it moving too slow? A lot of people move too fast, especially if they're making bowls. By the way, um, like their wheel might be going too fast. You really have to find that like even keel of like how fast you're pulling versus how fast your wheel is turning. But she knows that. Oh, this is passionate arts and crafts, by the way. Um, but yes. Also, if she has to throw with a sponge, fucking let her. Like, maybe a sponge is what needs to help her be a little bit more, like, I think of a sponge as a safety blanket, and um, I use it when I, I use them when I do larger things. It's absolutely okay to use a sponge. If you want to, that's fine. If you don't, also fine. But um, it might help to use a sponge on the outside. Um, But definitely, like, it could be from squeezing too hard, uh, not moving up fast, like not moving at all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> letting it just like kind of hold there, but you need to squeeze a little bit harder on the, uh, on the top than the bottom on your first pull, especially, mm-hmm. but beginners, I never expect them to get like that second pull really. Um, that's usually for a later scenario. Yeah. It seems like the, f- like the first pull you're really getting the height and like, the part that's moving the most is obviously the the wall, but you're like firming up the top half of it. Mm. And then the second pull, you're firming up the bottom half of it for the most part. You're not really moving mm-hmm. a ton of clay up from the top, from the half up. And the right. last one, you're kind of moving up the bottom third mostly or like shaping. Yeah, yeah, shaping. So you're kind of yeah, like moving sure. back, moving in reverse. Yeah, like reverse of what you would think. I like the first, if on your first pull, if you're, if your pot is a is a half an inch to a quarter, three quarters of an inch thick, on the top, that's too thick. Like it needs to be like half to less than a half, um, in my yeah. opinion, just because it will help you as you get higher. If you're making like a mug. Yeah, if you're making a mug or what have you, yeah. Yeah. A bowl might be a little bit different, but honestly, yeah. honestly, you know what I always thought when I was younger is that bowls were like. Bowls are the easy thing. No. Bowls are intermediate. <laughs> Bowls are fucking intermediate. <laughs> well, I think there's a few different ways to, like, make them. Like, you could, yeah. you could like, make a first pull and leave it a little thicker at the top because you're going to, like, belly it out and you're going to need more of that. That's what I do. That yeah, thickness that's what I do. to spread the diameter you want. So, or you could, like. Well, yeah, that's why I'm saying they're intermediate because there's, yeah. like, so much involved in throwing a bowl correctly. Yeah. And like, well, you know, and like at the beginning, you're like, that's the only thing you throw because you can't figure out how to throw a fucking cylinder. Uh-huh. And so you're like, oh, yeah, I can throw bowls. No, you can't. When I first learned to throw bowls <laughs> in high school, I would uh, I would throw a cylinder and then they would teach us to like bevel the top edge. So it was like outward. That's what I teach. And then you you kind of I think you start I think they taught us to start from the middle and work no. our way up with a yep. with a wooden rib until you met that bevel mm-hmm. and then lay it down and then do it again. That's good that I'm not the only one that teaches that. I've never seen anybody teach that, but that's how, that's how I teach them too. Yeah. But I don't teach with a rib. I just teach with a sponge, but same thing. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's more focused really on working help. inside instead of like using your hands on the outside to say, well, you need to put the pressure pushing outward from the inside. Yeah. It's more like just, you know, like the, the biggest thing the that I found, especially when directing people to make bowls, is that on the last shaping pull or push, I guess, um, if you use a sponge and you start in the very middle of your base and push down and out, but specifically down and out, like you're going to get a lot nicer of a, a belly on the bottom um, as opposed to just pushing out and starting like three inches from the base middle base you know 
oh, like yeah, the center like, point. Yeah. Like you have to push down. And that's what like never really registered in my brain. <laughs> like to teach at least. Like, no, that pressure and it doesn't make any sense. The pressure needs to be down and that's what like really pushes it out and like to make this beautiful, nice like curve. Yeah. You know? And you I've seen you do it, but like remove a little bit of clay before you do your third mm -hmm. Before your third you do motion. your last shaping pull, remove a little bit of clay on the bottom, unless you're doing wide bowls. And if you're doing wide bowls, don't remove that clay um, and use that clay to extend your your bottom, like the the base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. If y'all like that instruction, somebody does consults. <laughs> right. And it is not me. <laughs> It would be interesting to see if I could do like a verbal, just like, ver well, I mean, I kind of did just do a verbal like teaching thing, but it would be, I've always kind of wanted to like take a shape or like take throwing and just like do it, like do a verbal I lesson. think it would, I think it'd be kind of cool to, to vary it. Like maybe you do one, here's how you could do it if you are generally a faster worker, like if you, yeah. your wheel speed's faster or if you're a heavy water user, here's how you should do it. Or if you're a slow wheel speed, or if yeah. you change speeds throughout. Yeah. Well, I do, I would say this. There's a lot of people that have heavy, fast wheels. Like, they do fast wheel throwing. And they shouldn't be. Like, they're going too fast. That's the reason why they aren't being successful. If they're not successful. Um... Sometimes you just gotta slow the fuck down. Like, slow your fucking wheel down. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like, sometimes that's just what it needs to happen. Especially when you're throwing bowls. Like, when you're throwing a bowl, you're literally moving the clay outward. If you go fast, it's just gonna keep going out. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you have to have pretty great control to yeah. be able to keep that clay where you want it to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I'm like, no, 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 slower, slower, slower. <laughs> like that's what usually happens in the consults. Slower, slow, slower, slower. We're being efficient here. We're not being fast. <laughs> We're being efficient. Efficient. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did find out though with intermediate people, I think I'm going to start doing half hour consultations because like. An hour is too long. An hour is too long. Because we're t we're doing we're talking about the smallest changes, uh -huh. like I did one with. Um, I'll ask her if this is okay afterwards. But I did one with Ashley, Ball, and uh -huh. I was like, I don't think we should do an hour. I basically told her I was like, you don't need one. <laughs> like like you probably don't need a consultation, but we'll do one anyway. And I was, I was like, as long as it takes, I'll just refund the money back, <laughs> you know. Um, you need to but, do like a 30-minute one, but like I feel like the tips you're going to have for an intermediate, is pro they're probably going to see the value in it way more. Right, yeah. So like, like she, you so could we, change it. It did end up being only 30 minutes, and but I changed, I helped her change like a few things, and she texted, like she messaged me like an hour later. She was like, I cut off a minute of my time. Yeah. So like... It's it's very substantial, but it's just really quick. It's like, okay, you've showed me that you're thrown like you've thrown once, and I'm like, you need to do this, 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 and this. Yeah, that's it. So if you did thirty minutes, maybe you just price it like forty bucks for thirty minutes or sixty bucks for sixty minutes. Yeah. Like, well, I was it's, thinking it's still beneficial, but it makes more sense for them to pay for an hour if they want. I think what would make sense for an immediate actually, instead of just one thirty minute minute. Uh, 30 minute one is to do two 30 minute ones once like a month apart so that you can um, oh yeah so that you can talk about what you've been doing and then kind of like oh little subscription there. service consult yeah yeah nice i like that it's like yeah you can help somebody to get to an intermediate level but once they've like then you're gonna have to practice to get to intermediate and then once you, you get to that point then Plus it's they like, could, they could okay. throw other forms too and say like, I need help with this form. Yeah. That might take fifteen minutes. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. It was good to 
finally do one with somebody who was like at that level Mm -hmm. so that it was like okay i don't need to tell you how to do your first pull i don't need to tell you how to do your second pull i just need to tell you to be more aggressive on that second pull and to you know Mm -hmm. like so that was a nice nice moment yeah it's probably nice to just like watch people throw and you're just like objectively like all right Let's see what we could do here, and then let's see what we could do here. I mean, that literally is what, like, I live for. Like, <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love being, and, and it's, like, so satisfying when they get it, when the light clicks on. Or, like, when you do something, and they're like, I just can't get this. And I'm like, oh, that's why. <laughs> and then it, like, totally goes into, you know, it's just so freaking rewarding to, like, see people. Yeah succeed yeah well yeah plus it's like kind of it's vulnerable for having someone to watch you make to throw like especially when you're at a level where it's like i've been making on my own for years and i work in my own studio like nobody sees me work and there's nobody that's going to objectively tell me something so you almost have to pay for somebody to tell you something so that you can improve oh for sure and like and everybody's always like i'm so nervous i'm like please don't be freaking nervous like i'm gonna make jokes and i'm gonna make you feel super comfortable like you're Mm -hmm. fine like and there's a there's a lot of people that you might know is like friends and stuff that you know what their end result pieces look like but you don't know how they got to that end result you don't know how they make it you don't know how efficient they are right you know you don't know if they're an expert in like efficiency of throwing or they throw really well yeah or if they just trim a lot off and they end up with a good pot in the end but right but uh, oh. I think these days you can see a lot of people's process more and more mm-hmm. with Instagram. So, okay. Yeah, For I know sure. Erica's looking forward to uh I'm visit. looking forward to it. It's going to be so much fun. I haven't done, well, it's going to be after. I honestly, like, doing them online has been so much easier than doing consultations in person. Um, well, yeah, you don't have to spend time to drive to and from like, no, it's not even that I'm doing one in person tomorrow and I'm going to, I'm glad because I'm going on the first to do lessons in person as well. But like, it's so easy for me to just watch (laughs) and just be like, this is what you need to do, you know? And, um, and it gives them, there's no handicap for them. You know, I'm not there to like put their hands somewhere. They have to figure it out on their own. So it's like oh. almost easier to teach them over the internet than it is what I remember teaching in person. So it'll be interesting to like go tomorrow and do that. So Nice. Yeah, and you I'm, can tell them like, yeah. "Hey, I'm going to talk you through what to do. I'm not going to I'm and not going to physically push you to push harder." Like Yeah. The only thing that's hard is centering. Like the only thing that I'm really having a struggle with is like telling somebody how to center better. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. uh, you need to put your whole body's weight on this, please. <laughs> no <Yeah>. more. <laughs> and like, how close are you? Where are you? Where how much is clay your is weight that? right how now? How stiff is it? <laughs> like, is how your butt is <laughs> lightly off the seat so you're like, you know? Yeah, that's the only hard part. I think that's my only requirement. You need to ha- know how to center. <laughs> like, yeah, so. there's plenty of room to go from there once you know how to center. Yeah. Okay, sweet. All right, do we want to go to this last one here? Oh, yeah. I thought we were done. All right, there's one more that is kiln-related. Uh, Ryan and Becca, I had a question for you. I have had my eyes set on a Scut KM kiln and have been saving up. A friend recently mentioned that they are looking to sell their Crest manual kiln they had bought refurbished from a reputable place. I'm nervous about a kiln sitter set up, but excited to pay one-fifth less than I was planning to for a kiln. Are there any downsides to starting with a kiln sitter set up? A underscore niche underscore insta. I always recommend starting with a kiln setter set up. Yeah. I mean, for one, the price is great. I mean, you're going to get so much more value out of learning what you're doing. Yeah. With maintaining a kiln. 
I'm I don't just... know. It's almost like buying a beat up car, like your very first car being like an absolute beater. You know, like it's like you have so much more appreciation for kilns. <laughs> I feel like you do that because you're gonna wreck the son of a bitch within the first couple of years. That too, but um, <laughs> but like I don't know. I love kiln sitters. I almost wish that I had a kiln sitter because they're almost they're like almost fail safe. You know. Um, I do obviously love the controller, but, and there's always an option of getting a controller, an external controller that plugs into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you are, but, um, in Washington they sell them. I don't know if anybody else sells them, honestly. Um, but yeah, I definitely, definitely do not shy away from a kiln setter. Like, yeah, fire is the same almost, you know? Yeah, would you say, it, does it make any difference if you are, depending on what situation you're in, let's say you're strictly hobbyist, like you don't care about making it a long-term thing, um, or what factors would keep you from the kiln center? I guess if you had money to spend and you didn't care, you literally yeah. wanted to go with the easiest option that is going to work for you with the least amount of headache. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the thing about a kiln sitter is that you have to go and manually turn it up. That's the biggest thing is that, you know, you just have to, if you're like an on the go type person all the time, we're not telling you that you should leave your kiln unattended. But if you're an on the go type person or like the only time you can fire is in the middle of the night, <laughs> um, maybe don't get a kiln sitter. <laughs> but uh, it does take you know, every two, it's just like having a baby every two hours, you got to go out and turn the Mm -hmm. knobs. So that is one thing. Um, if you have to hold for some reason, that's kind of difficult, um, to know when that happens, but, but it does kind of teach you to be like super simple with your glazes when you say like, like your glaze application and stuff or no, just... But just like basic firing, you know, where it's like, I don't need a super long hold. I don't need you know yeah i mean ultimately you just need to get that cone to bend and that's it and that's it like so and if your glaze doesn't work with that then you're like well i'll just fix the glaze <laughs> and I mean, that I, is nice for later on Makes i mean the one other the one downside is you do have to put in some work to like understand what's going on with the kiln because if there are issues with like elements going out or like this is where witness cones help you know, yeah. you don't have a controller that's going to tell you, hey, there was an error. And then you can look up what that error was right. and it tells you exactly what to do. Or you yeah, can call you... up a number and say, all right, what's going on with my kiln? Like, And you need to like, this is one of those things where if you get the kiln sitter, which we are recommending you do. Um, if you get the kiln sitter, you know, fill it up with shelves and, and stilts, no pieces. Fire it. I would do a firing in a bis schedule and I would do a firing in, in a glaze schedule and time it and um, see how long those take just like an empty one just to see uh, just so that you have a standard for what you're dealing with because you, you're right there is nothing that like uh, like tells you something's wrong you know like your kiln could be going for 15 hours when it should be going for nine and you have no idea you know, yeah. unless you go down and check frequently, but like, um, but you don't know, you just keep going and you're like, well, yeah. that thing's got to bend at some point, but <laughs> some it could point, be that like, an element's out and the other ones are overcompensating for it. Or it could be that your, your stilt got stuck, you know, the, the, the cone yeah. got stuck in the And cancer. everything's melting inside like, because you don't know yeah, why it's like, not going off. This is also another reason to make sure that you have your witness cones in eyesight you know, of the peephole, that's why peepholes exist, um, to have the witness cones in eyesight so that you know when it drops, that's your safety net. And like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, honestly, it can teach you so much. And it's like the perfect starter kiln in my opinion. Yeah. Even if you're like, okay, I'm going to do this for the long term. And like, I still think you need to know those basics of a kiln and firing and loading yeah and then you're like okay now i know how to load this kiln i know what kiln stilt heights i like you know i i know how to take care of my shelves like kiln i know what kiln wash is and why to do that because you 
if you ruin a small kiln shell from a kiln sitter, it's probably a lot cheaper than ruining a big kiln shelf yeah. that's, you know, a 25-inch shelf or 22-inch shelf. Well, I mean, I've had I've had 10 cubic foot kilns that are kilns, so, but... Kilns, oh, yeah. Yeah, but also remember, you can always get an electronic attachment later if, you know, you find that, like, going out every two hours, um, and that, those ones, it's the box the Bartlett box and you just plug it into the side of the box and that and then you put a thermocouple into the kiln and that um what plugs into the box because you have the elements the cord like, the cord plugs in so like yeah, yeah. It, it plugs into the wall no the cord plugs into the box and then the box plugs into the wall what cord plugs into the box the kiln cord plugs into the box the power cord the power cord plugs from the into kiln. the box. Okay. Yes. And then the box has another power cord, and then it's plugged into the wall. And so then there is a thermocouple that goes into the kiln that's connected to the box. And mm -hmm. then the, the box. The Bartlett box. Yes. And you put on the kiln at high all the time, and it just regulates itself. Oh, really? Yeah. So what? So the power going to the the Bartlett just determines how much power to put through the element. Okay, that's yeah. what I was wondering. I was like, how do you connect the box element wires to the elements themselves on the rings? So that's how. Yeah. Okay. It's, so it's always on high, and that's how elements are. They're always on high. They just turn off and on right. at a certain rate. So. Wait, wait, wait. I thought when you changed the knobs, that just changed the amount of... So you're saying on a ki on a manual kiln, when you turn the knob to low, it's, it's still like the same amount of power going through the element as when it's on high? Yeah. It's just... It's, okay. I, thought it, I thought it had less power going through it when it's on low. No. It's the same... If I understand correctly, it's the same amount of power that's going through. It's just turning on and off slower. So it's like it'll turn on really quick and turn off, and then it'll wait, and then it'll turn on really quick, and then turn off, and then it'll wait. And oh. then on medium, it's like on, off, wait, on, off, wait, and then on high, it's on. <laughs> like Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's the, the knobs are really communicating more with, like, the relay. Yeah. Than it is the power. Correct. Oh, okay. I that's didn't know why that. That makes more simple, sense, actually. That's why they're such simple machines. They're always on high. The relay is the only thing that's really changing yeah. anything. And you can hear that with even an electronic controller. You can hear when it's like clicking the on powers and off, yeah. clicking on and off, and that's the okay. Huh? I just learned something. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Plus, I feel like it's nice to upgrade, like totally. over time, and then you can pass on your kiln to somebody else that is up and coming and figuring things out. Yeah. Who needs a brand new kiln? Get a brand new kiln after you've done it for like 10 years. I mean, some people have had used kilns and they're like, I've literally never changed my elements. I'm terrified of it. I don't know what to do. I'm going to break something. But if you're going to break something, break something with the manual kiln sitter kiln. Yeah, it's so easy to fix. But, um, yeah, I'm like, figure it out. Like, you can do this. It's not that difficult. No. I don't know how much it costs to have somebody come replace your elements for you or, like, diagnose a kiln for you, but I'm sure it's not cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Just do it. Just do it regular, and then, yeah. Just get the fucking kiln setter. It's, it's going to be a great kiln. I think they're more... I think they can be more reliable than electric mm -hmm. kilns. Like, old electric kilns. New electric kilns? Fine. But, um... Plus, there's a mar there's a big market out there with old kilns. Mm -hmm. Like people, yeah. people get into it and they forget about it and they have them piled up yeah. and they literally give them to you for free. Also, it's a Cress, which is a pretty good brand. Um, I would shy away from Crucible. Typically, that's a that's a really old one. Yeah, Crucible's really old. I feel like you'll see some Crests out there. You'll see some Paragons out there. Some Duncans. I mean, make obviously make sure the the temp is high enough too. Like, Some oh, scut. did you see my <laughs> fucking what? Val? 
now like texted me and she's like this kiln is across the street for three hundred dollars should i get it and i was like well what's the temp on the side and she's like it looks immaculate inside i was like well what's the temp it was cone one cone one <laughs> yeah and i was like aboard 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 <laughs> i saw that that was val yeah <laughs> I was like, That's get funny. out now. <laughs> Don't even look at it. <laughs> They're going to use car salesman you <laughs> into this yeah. kiln. Don't worry about the one. It's it's a 10. It's... The zero fell off of it somewhere. I don't know. Oof. Yeah. Kiln sitter kilns. Got to get on it. Mm. I would. Lo- I love kiln sitters. How much do the electronic controller attachments like cost? It was expensive. It was like 400 bucks. Is that worth getting that over that was upgrading years ago. the kiln? Years ago. Honestly, those kilns worked for me for years after that. Years. Okay. So it's worth the investment to get the controller yeah. versus actually paying for an all-new kiln if you are still good with the yeah. amount of space you have in it. And what's great about the controller is that if you get two kilns that are the same amperage, um, you can just move the thermocouple. <laughs> from one kiln to the next <laughs> so like yeah. so um i would fire my crest kiln i think it was a crest i would fire the crest and um it would get up to temp all as well oh also what i like about having the electronic and the kiln sitter is that it has that safety guard of the kiln sitter so i would always put a seven cone in there so that if it did hit cone seven it just dropped and stopped mm-hmm. um but so um i would always fire the you know i'd fire the crest and then it would get to temp all was well and then i'd unplug it plug my other one in and then plug and then put the thermocouple in just like move it over to the other kiln Mm -hmm. and boom did you have to just drill a hole for the thermocouple yeah it's easy yeah and there's always there's pretty much always a hole on the back side of um of the kiln sitter of any kiln but the kiln sitter kilns there's always like a tiny little hole in the metal um and that's where your thermocouple goes it's usually in the middle in the middle uh, about f- two feet away from the controller panel on the right side um and hmm. um yeah so yeah that was really nice i really it was great to have that and um yeah plus it'll usually i I think usually you'll use less amps too with the i feel like you might get a smaller kiln it won't use many amps with the the plug and stuff yeah and the wire that you need to hook it up but then if you do upgrade you might need to update the the wiring for your uh if you get a also, new that's bigger. Also I will say that that um controller box completely saved my ass. Like it saved my house from burning down. Um because the kiln that I had was on wheels and I would normally turn it and I forgot to turn it that one time in the in the um the wire was touching the kiln and it melted and it Ooh. shorted out the box and turned off my power and it melted to the box and if it had melted to my plug it would have been a hell of a lot worse could have caused way more problems but it melted to the box instead of melting to the plug and the box shorted out so and it was an wow. easy fix too I, I fixed the box no problem so wow interesting yeah I would never even think about like get up like getting a controller but i'll like use those kilns until their legs fall off and then i'll stumble upon a good deal and that's when i would get upgrade <laughs> yeah i feel well, like you yeah. always kind of got to be looking like if you even have an inkling of like interest in seeing like you need to start looking i feel like when you get to that desperation point where like i need to get one i need to pay full price for one yeah like I, you know, when I was looking for kilns, I'd look for like three or four months, even when I wasn't even in the market for it. I would just like, look. Yeah. Marketplace, Craigslist, like, you could find them out there. Yeah. 
All right. Anything oh. else today? I don't think so. A lot of studio stuff. Oh, um, well, this will come out after last week's episode, but Pot Swap Sign Up is... I forgot the dates already. I was like, do you have the documents up? No. Pot Swap Sign Up is... <sighs> Sign ups will start to the public on, on October sixteenth at twelve PM Eastern Eastern time. Yep. October sixteenth, twelve PM Eastern time. That should be late afternoon in Europe and like nine o'clock on the on the West Coast. So that should be good for mm -hmm. everybody. And for those of you that participated in last year, we've already told you all this in the past, but if you participate the previous year, you will get an email directly to you. Yeah, a couple days uh, before. Two days before. And it'll be like, hey, pot swap time, sign up. So yep. that's your benefit. If you do it, you get in first. Yep. And we're going to have a thousand people in this year. Hitting be good. four digits. Four digits. Five year anniversary, a thousand. Oh my goodness. I'm getting excited for it. I, I was dreading it, but to... now that we've talked about it in the timeline yeah. and stuff, I'm I'm not as Well, it's a lot easier last worried. year we set it up so well to just like go. Yeah, we know uh, what we're I doing. But I will say I will say that this year I'm a little bit like apprehensive. Like I don't really want to get anything. Because you're getting rid of stuff? Yeah. I want to give, but I don't want to get anything, so I don't know how to... So I need to pick a, a good person that will send you something good? I don't know. I don't know. I, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Because, like, I'm going to be I feel like you liked band. what you got last year. I can't remember what it was, but... Oh, yeah, I got the mug with the goose on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fledgling Studios? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> um, Who did you get last year? Ceramics by Jenny. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. She wrote me a very nice note. Oh. I kept it. It's in my studio. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's like I want to do all the things, but I don't really need the thing. So maybe I can send a note to my person, or you could send a note to my person and say, hey, you're going to make this for Becca, but she's going to give it to somebody as a gift. Oh, like you're going to get the pot, but you're going to gift it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Who are you going to give it to, me? I don't know. <laughs> somebody who needs it more than us. <laughs> I don't know. Hmm. Okay. I'll figure it out. Maybe I'll just take the pot. I feel like there's like an option out there to to do like a like a letter swap in a different a different time than pot swap. Like literally just like swap a letter like write a letter or something. Like a pen you know? pal situation? But it's just random, right? You're just like, yeah. I don't know. You t I mean, that's part of what you include. You include your little story and journey and stuff in there. Yeah. I don't know. Do you get letters these days? I feel like it's kind of exciting when you get something that's... I yeah. mean, I get excited when I... The only letters I get nowadays that I'm excited about are like checks from galleries. When I'm like, <laughs> oh, I wasn't expecting this. I got a check today. Woo. So my friend Jen in California, uh, the only non-potter that listens to this podcast, um, other than your mom... Uh, <laughs> she sends me postcards from every single place that they go. And she's done this for years. So mm -hmm. um, she's big on, like, postcards and letters. Okay. Yeah. Nice. I don't even know that I know people's addresses, though, to send, like, a random letter, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Then it's like not a surprise. Sorry that I just made everybody yawn. Okay, we should go because, well, I took a nap before this, but I'm still tired. 
Yeah, I gotta get that kiln finished and get that yeah. fire going. I gotta, yeah, and I gotta upload our podcast from last week. So. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody, Sweet. for listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye. All right. Bye. Yo, yo, yiggity, yo. It's Becca here. Hey, just so you know, thank you for listening. And also, we have. What do we have again? A Patreon. We have a Patreon that you should go and if you want to donate to, you could donate to it. If you don't, that's cool too. But um, just Google Wheel Talk Podcast Patreon. Don't do the other one because uh, there is a Wheel Talk on Patreon, but it's not us. So make sure you get the right one. It's and in the show notes. It's in the show notes. And also, um, leave us a review because they're fun to read. Okay, bye. <laughs>